Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. We will just start shortly. Uh, thanks for joining. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And welcome to our webinar, Supercharge Your Postgres App 100x Faster with Single Store with Real Life Examples. My name is Yukti Devedi and I'll be your moderator today. One of my main jobs here at Single Store is to organize weekly AI webinars. We organize two webinars per week uh, and we demonstrate different data and AI use cases and different tools and technologies. I also post about our upcoming webinars every week. So if these topics are interesting to you, please feel free to connect with me to stay on top of the loop. I'll also like to hear your feedback or ideas on topics that you'd like to see in future sessions. So please feel free to connect and drop a message to me on LinkedIn. Uh, Speaking of future sessions, as you can see on your slide, you can uh, tomorrow we have a very amazing session that's coming up. Run single store plus local LLM on your Mac for private data analytics with Olama. Very good for people that are dealing with sensitive data that they don't really want to put on a cloud. And on July 11th, we have how to build real-time AI apps on iceberg data. This uh, revolves around our recent product launch for uh, helping enterprises come up with uh, good solutions to build gen AI apps that are based uh, for people that are dealing with data that is stuck in an iceberg like situation. So it's a must attend for those people. And a recording is also available that is there on your screen. You can go to the landing page to view that recording uh, to watch unfreeze your iceberg data for real time AI. And uh, I think you'll be all set for that webinar if that's interesting to you. RSVP right now and I hope to see you all there. So coming back to today's topic, you're welcome to participate in the discussion throughout the session using the Zoom Q&A button, which is present at the bottom of your console. We have an internal mission statement to try to answer 100% of the audience questions, even if that means following up with people after afterwards via email. But uh, we are absolutely up to the challenge. So please ask away because uh, that really matters to us. And we won't be answering any anonymous questions. I hope that's understandable. Just make sure you've logged into Zoom with your email and uh, actual name. So we love everyone to have a dynamic experience during this webinar. So feel free to try out single store notebooks. Anyone who tries it today will be entered for a chance to win either branded new AirPods Pro or Meta's new Ray-Ban LLM smart glasses. It's absolutely the winner's choice. Simply click the link that's present on your screen or you can scan the QR code just log in it just takes a few seconds to make a uh, account and you might know that single store has had a free trial offer for many years but just in the past few weeks we have also announced a new free share tier which we will talk about a bit later today so also you might have noticed that we have an auto RSVP to our future AI webinars options on our website so if you visit any of these landing pages there's now a checkbox to auto register which will add future upcoming zooms automatically to your calendar which obviously you don't really need to attend each webinar live which is just an option for those who have requested to automatically receive the video recordings and github links which are relevant or useful for the session so moving on allow me to introduce our amazing speaker today we have the real database expert uh, akmal Chaudhary, who is a subject matter expert when it comes data and AI use cases and is a regular webinars. Uh, we are very happy to have you. Okay, thank you, uh, Yukti. You're, you're breaking up there a little bit, so uh, but you seem to be okay now. So uh, hopefully my uh, internet connection is uh, is good as well. And again, uh, uh, let me know if there's any problems there. And again, uh, I'll extend my welcome to all of you as well. Thank you very much for joining. And we know your time is valuable. So hopefully we will make this as interesting and as useful to you as we can. Uh, so I've got a fairly short agenda in terms of what I'd like to cover. Uh, although I think uh, if you've attended any of my previous sessions, you know that I, I tend to talk too much. So <laughs> I go on and on. I tend to cut back on my slides considerably. And then we try and do demos. Uh, here, uh, there's various things that I'd like to discuss with you today and give you some practical sort of examples of customers um, and, and their experiences, okay? And uh, yes, it, there is a kind of a demo, not quite what I wanted to show you, uh, and I'll explain a little bit later why that is, okay? But uh, we'll see, okay? And if this time, uh, we'll, we'll have a go at that. Um, so without further ado, let me just... Uh, Go a little bit and say the standard kind of two slides that we show about single store the company and the technology itself and so here is the uh, 
history of the company, if you like, founded all the way back in 2011 as MemSQL. And we are right at the end here at uh, 2024 now. And so as you can see, quite a bit has happened during that uh, period of time. So originally, both the product and the company used to be called MemSQL. And it was very much focused around in-memory processing for OLTP. Uh, subsequently, Column Store was added. Here we go. And OLAP support that's going back around about 2015. And uh, we've had uh, vector search, very popular topic today since about 2017. And uh, over this period of time, uh, the both the revenue has increased. So here you can see we are now a US $100 million plus annual recurring revenue, ARR company. Let me just try and highlight this for you. There we go. And uh, over 350 global customers. Someone asked me the question, is that 350K? Uh, not yet. Okay, so we are trying. Uh, hopefully we'll get there. And if you look on the bottom there, in terms of the investors, you can see there are some very well-known names there. So some of these companies are actually our customers as well. And actually, I think they became customers and then they became in that, uh, our investors. It's a bit like that story that I told before, is the gentleman who bought the shaver and he liked it so much that he went off and bought the company. Uh, so it's a bit, I guess it's a similar kind of scenario there. Okay. Um, as far as the technology is concerned, then, so uh, recall that I mentioned the column store capability was added. So we have this concept now of universal storage, okay? So the ability to handle both OLTP and OLAP, single table type will do that for you. And variety of ways that we can ingest data. So we've demonstrated Kafka in the past, for example. We've looked at Apache Spark integration. And uh, I think some of my colleagues have talked about S3, for example, uh, but Hadoop as well is another possibility. And uh, we use this concept of pipelines here. Okay, so this is what the animation is showing in parallel at scale. And uh, I will try and, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll try and demo this for you a little bit later on. Okay, so we'll talk about that because this is the kind of underlying technology that we use in a couple of connectors that we have uh, already available for two key technologies uh, out there. And uh, Postgres is the is the is another one that's being added uh, even as we speak. Uh, we work on all three major cloud platforms. Okay, and today I will be using AWS, okay, but Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, you can run on-prem as well. There is a hybrid mode as well now. So you can run part of your uh, single store infrastructure locally within your own environment, and then part of it can be in the cloud. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I, that is a recent kind of innovation. I was not aware of that, but that is, again, something that may offer you uh, some you know possibilities in terms of how you build your systems and give you some confidence in terms of local storage as well within your environments versus having everything in the cloud, if that's important to you. Uh, there's a Docker container available as well. Uh, some of the stored types, so at its heart, it is a relational database management system. Okay, does other things as well, geospatial, okay, time series, JSON support, uh, even customers do using it for key value there. We have uh, full text search available through the Lucene, okay, full text engine and vectors, which I kind of mentioned there already. Uh, so vectors rather important, as I said before, uh, the product has had this support for some time. I believe it was originally a financial customer that requested it back in 2017. Uh, very important today because of Gen AI and, you know, all of these LLMs and uh, creating these vector embeddings and doing RAG applications and so on. Uh, a single store has not been idle. Significant innovations early this year. More innovations recently announced at the uh, iceberg event that Yukti uh, mentioned. And then finally, just to wrap it up, okay, so real-time decisions, AI apps, dynamic experiences, dashboards, ad hoc queries, machine learning. Uh, and actually, we'll be looking at a couple of these uh, elements. So there is a case study here where we talk very much around this whole idea of building interactive dashboards from one of our customers. Uh, and that's coming up a, a little bit later on. So overall, you can see uh, in terms of the technology, it's quite wide ranging in terms of its capabilities and much more than a database system. Now, I mean, with the introduction of 
uh, support, you know, for Jupyter Notebooks, which we will use a little bit later on, time permitting. And uh, you have now really a, a kind of almost an end-to-end -end sort of uh, environment where you can develop, test, uh, and uh, build applications and do so in a variety of different ways. So whether you, you, you want to use Python, for example, or you want to use the machine learning, or you want to integrate with these external technologies such as Kafka and Spark, for example, or Iceberg even, uh, as the recent announcement was, and so on. I mean, there's many things that you can do now. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at Postgres. Uh, and I'm kind of showing my age here. So many years ago, when I was a researcher, I, I came across Postgres and, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting because Postgres, I know it's PostgreSQL, SQL, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it correctly. Uh, I, I think it's an awkward name. I mean, just stick to Postgres. Okay, that's what I'll call it. Uh, but it was kind of post Ingress. So Ingress was developed many years ago and uh, it was subsequently released commercially. I actually worked on it as well. Uh, during my um, time at uh, Computer Associates, who had acquired it um, at that time. Uh, but Postgres was developed, I think, to provide richer capabilities, post-ingress in terms of, you know, beyond relational. And uh, I know that it provides a number of very interesting capabilities. So well, I mentioned single store's ability to work with JSON, for example, and geospatial. Um, I know that Postgres can do these as well, okay, through these uh, extenders and libraries and things as well. Um, that's fine. However, uh, in this presentation, I think we are very much focused around the standalone open source technology, okay? So I'll elaborate a little bit more on that shortly. Mm -hmm. But some of the issues that you may be experiencing in terms of your use of that technology in your environment, um, perhaps scale, okay? And this is kind of scale out versus scale up, okay? Performance at scale, there may be some issues around that as well. And again, some customer examples coming up to kind of give you a little bit more around that. Lack of replication, high availability, these can be added. You can custom build and there are other third party sort of possibilities around that as well. Uh, lack of native multi-master support and right ahead logging overhead as well. So just some of the issues that you might be experiencing and some of the problems. Now, not to take anything away from it, okay? I mean, it is an awesome technology, very popular, widely used today, um, very robust as well. And I think for many of the applications that people use it for, they are very happy with it, that's fine. But here we are talking about a, a different level in terms of you know scaling up to huge quantities of data or maybe the performance requirements or the SLAs that you have to meet, simply it doesn't cut it. Um, and no matter what you do to try and extend it or to overcome those limitations, it could be quite challenging. Um, so some structural problems, okay? So Postgres isn't natively distributed, okay? Again, remember that our focus is very much around the uh, open source technology here, single node architecture, complex sharding approaches, uh, challenges with terabytes or petabytes of data, okay? And today that seems to be the norm, you know, petabytes. Uh, I very, during my time when I was a researcher many years ago, had the privilege to go to CERN uh, in, um, you know, the Swiss French uh, uh, border uh, at, at a time where they were planning these uh, air large hadron collider experiments, you know, atom smashing to find out what matter is made of, this Higgs boson and so on at huge quantities of data that they were planning to uh, to store. Um, so in those days, you know, people were saying, oh, it's going to be petabytes, 40 petabytes for each experiment, huge amounts of data. Today, that's almost the norm, you know, in terms of the volumes of data that organizations tend to deal with, it's enormous. And much of it, sadly, seems to be unused. So we're not really getting the insights that we want from the, all this data that, that we have. Um, Postgres isn't meant for OLAP, okay? It's a row store, lacks OLAP features like column store, for example, you know, vectorized query execution um, and so on. Poor performance and high cardinality queries as well. And last but not least, costs much more than you'd expect, okay? So there are some things that could be important that could help. Things like columnar compression, for example, separation of storage and compute, okay? This is something that single store provides. And potentially, you may be using other database management systems to help you overcome some of these limitations and structural problems. Okay, now, um, possibly you have this kind of scenario where maybe you're using Postgres today, okay, batch ingest, okay, so this is your uh, 
Postgres database here in the middle. And perhaps you need to do some operational uh, work as well. JSON, a uh, very popular format for documents and uh, the growth in NoSQL databases such as MongoDB, Couchbase, and so on. Um, Postgres has got JSONB, okay, JSON support as well. That is that is uh, a, 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 an interesting and good feature as well. Caching. So sometimes we need some of other technologies to sit in front of these uh, uh, open source relational systems to improve the performance. Okay, uh, and I know from my experience that in MySQL, for example, particularly Redis and and MySQL are a very good combination to deal with those kind of scenarios. Um, equally, in terms of search, then you know Elasticsearch, perhaps using something like that to add uh, search capabilities, and then perhaps dealing with streaming data. You know, you plug in Kafka, for example. And uh, maybe for analytics, you need a, some kind of data warehouse technology here. I think uh, we are showing uh, Snowflake as the example. Uh, and last but not least, you know, maybe dealing with things like vectors. Again, I'm aware that uh, PG vector is uh, uh, available with Postgres. A little bit more about that very shortly. So overall, it may be, again, that you need to augment the technology with other products and services in order to be able to accomplish what you need. As good as the product is and as solid as it as it is, I mean, it's, again, very well uh, maintained and uh, has a great community surrounding it, uh, but simply sometimes it may not cut it in the production environments, okay? So the examples in a focus today is very much around this. I've mentioned this a couple of times already, okay? The single box DBs uh, scaled up, don't scale out. Now, I, I kind of appreciate that there are alternatives that you could look at, you know, based around kind of Postgres and distributed sort of SQL databases as well, as well as other sort of cloud-based offerings too. Uh, we are not really going to focus on those today simply for lack of time, okay? If these are interesting for you and you'd like to know more about how Single Store stacks up against these other alternatives, please let us know. Uh, drop you an email, let us know, okay? And then we will schedule appropriate webinars in the near future as best we can, okay? All right, let's go. Now... As part of the research that I was just doing recently uh, for this webinar, and I was looking around at examples, I came across this wonderful case study and story, uh, a company called Figma, okay? And this was published on Byte Byte Go. Uh, you may be a subscriber already. And it says 100x scaling, how Figma scaled its databases. So they are a Postgres user. And then I was reading the story and I, and there are a whole bunch of things this organization did in order to meet their requirements and just, you know, scale up the product to be able to satisfy the kind of requirements that they have. And uh, I think it was Alex Zhu, who is the gentleman that manages this website, who is the founder of uh, Byte Byte Go, asked this question. And you can see his uh, post on LinkedIn. It's on X as well, as well as, uh, um, you know, some other websites as well. And he posed this question here, you know, saying that all of this work that they've put in, as you can see the diagram on the right hand side, uh, that's kind of a summarization of it. So they actually wrote some stuff to be able to deal with the scalability issue. And then he posed this question and he said, you know, would you have done it differently? And I was thinking to myself and saying, yes, you know, just buy something that does all this for you. Um, the key thing is that with a lot of technology today, unless you happen to be on the scale of Facebook or Google or Uber or one of these organizations that has the time, resources, money, uh, talent to be able to build your own technology uh, simply because off the shelf, uh, it doesn't, you know, it simply will not match your requirement. For the rest of us, we tend to buy off the shelf, okay? It makes much more sense. Um, many years ago, the first job that I held in IT, I worked for Reuters in London, and one of the first projects that I worked on was intelligent multiplexers. And it was a real challenge for me. It was probably the worst eight months of my life because I had to pick up the pieces for some system that had been written quite some time before I joined the company. And a lot of the knowledge, the expertise, the documentation had gone. And this is one of the problems that you have within organizations that un unless and until you know things are maintained properly, they are documented properly, um, there are systems to be able to capture the changes and all of these kind of things. Uh, people inevitably leave, documentation gets lost, information gets lost. And it was very, very challenging for me to spend, you know, sort of eight months trying to figure out how this thing worked and be able to make a small set of changes. Um, in the end of the day, I mean, it was it was great experience on the job. 
Uh, and I learned a lot. So, uh, it, you know, it is something that I it was both a, a great challenge, but also a great learning experience for me. But the thing is that in the vast majority of organizations, unless we actually manage these things well, it becomes something that comes and bites us uh, later in life. OK, and then it becomes a real challenge because, as I said before, knowledge gets lost. People retire, people leave. Uh, they've left the company. And things are just left in a state where there isn't an awful lot that you can do in terms of understanding how things work. So it's difficult, I would say, and very challenging in order to you know, go through these kind of processes where essentially you're rolling your own. You're trying to you know, bend the technology to your requirements and doing so in a way that may be very challenging. You may accomplish it. It might take time. Um, but ultimately, it still has to be maintained and looked after and so on. OK, and these things pose significant challenges for us. OK, now, um, yes, granted that uh, Postgres supports JSON as well. Um, one of the things that you might be interested in is that uh, for analytics, especially uh, single store provides this SQL JSON capability. This is actually something I wrote about a little while ago. Let me find this example for you here. OK, so I uh, said accessing JSON data at warp speed in single store. So I took the opportunity to actually test this. And this was very, very useful because I installed a version of single store locally. And then there's a there's a couple of options to be able to enable and disable this SQL JSON. And I ran my own performance test. And by the way, this is the log scale. OK, so it looks pre pretty big in terms of difference. Uh, but that is very, very useful. And then I applied it not just to some uh, randomly generated data, but also to uh, some data obtained from the, I think it was the Los Angeles Police Department here. We're looking at a, a set of, let me just try and find that here. Um, there we go. Using Los Angeles Police Department crime data. So I actually did this process on actual real data as well. And again, you can see significant performance benefits uh, that we obtain. So if you're using Postgres for this sort of JSON type uh, uh, analytics, this is something that you might find is much, much better within the single store environment, OK? Uh, additionally, I'm, I promised that I would say something a little bit about P PG Vector. So as we discussed, you know, Vector is very important today, support for vectors as well. Uh, naturally, given Postgres's position as a popular open source database, you would expect that the vector support would come to that. And indeed, it, it has to some degree. And then here we can see some analysis of this. And this was done as part of the uh, Purdue uh, Database Research Group. This was published okay, as part of uh, some analysis comparing several technologies. Um, and single store generally comes out here. You can see much better than Postgres for sort of similar sort of problems here. There we go. OK, and this is, again, uh, published on our website. And then here on the right hand side, you can see the comparison. In this particular case, lower is better. As you can see, single store here. Uh, this is a well-known um, pure vector database offering. And then you've got the PG vector uh, right on the end there. And, and again, let me just try and uh, point you to that. There we go. So this is the article in our blog post um, from uh, uh, Eric Hansen and his colleagues. Uh, that uh, really document this in further detail. Okay, so if you're interested, we can send you the link to this. So this was done as part of a collaboration with uh, uh, a university in terms of some research work. Okay, so we can offer you superior performance in that uh, in that scope as well. All right, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about some customer case studies then. Uh, for those of you who had the opportunity to uh, participate in the product launch that we had a little bit earlier this year, which was called the uh, Pro Max, uh, we had uh, someone from Adobe attend. And uh, this was uh, kind of like a fireside discussion. And they talked through a couple of uh, areas where they are using single store. And so this is a, an awesome case study because this is part of uh, an application, uh, Adobe Workfront, okay, which I believe the company acquired a few years ago. And this is for looking at these kind of analytics, you know, building these dashboards. It's these customer facing applications, workflow plus task management. And if you're running some kind of marketing campaigns, you know, you want to understand how well these are doing and how successful you have been. You want to be able to create these very quickly, do analysis of the data quickly and get your results back as well. So you can make some business decisions as part of that. So this is an application uh, that, it, it, you know, a, a real customer has built. 
Um, and just to give you some sense of the scale of the data that they're dealing with, it's uh, over 300, uh, sorry, 3,600, over 3,600 enterprise customers, 500K monthly active users, 10 billion records, okay, need to be queried and joined. Um, and you're looking at of the order of 60 to 70 terabytes of data, and that's growing, I believe, by something like 20% each year, over 250 tables as well. And you've got an SLA in terms of target ingest and query latency for all of that of less than five seconds. And that's a fairly steep requirement. And so what Adobe originally did, they started with Postgres, okay? And what they found was that queries typically took over five minutes and sometimes just timed out. It was just not able to cope with the uh, with the demand. Aggregations across joins uh, or joins across hundreds of thousands of tasks uh, not working so well. Limited analytical capabilities, which we talked about uh, a few moments ago. And overall, and this is their words, not ours, okay? Poor customer experience, okay? It, they just did not meet their requirements. Subsequently, they moved to uh, Elasticsearch to see how that might work. And you, as you know, it deals with this kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, not um, flattened data, okay? And it was quite a challenge for them to be able to get it into a format that they could uh, work with. So data flattening was too complex. Price performance was the key challenge requiring too much memory as customers were onboarded. And it was good, okay? but not good enough, fast, but not exceptional in terms of performance, okay? So they they moved from one technology to another and then from Elasticsearch to single store. And what they were able to achieve with single store, fast interactive queries, okay? 1.8 seconds for complex queries, snappy user experience, okay? Remember they are building dashboards and these dashboards need to provide insights and analytics quickly to be able to see uh, the results. And these have to be interactive as well, okay? And so they have their own means of, being able to build those dashboards, but they need to be able to plug those into the uh, database management system. Uh, data freshness, using Kafka pipelines for immediate ingestion under two seconds, okay? So single store integrates really well with both Kafka and Spark and a uh, whole range of other technologies. And essentially the, the what they were trying to do, and this is the key point here, is democratizing reporting. Essentially allow any user to build and refine reports, not just have like a fixed set of templates that you can choose from, but be able to customize them to their own requirements and be able to get the results back that they need. So that was the, the, the challenge there. Um, overall, in terms of impact and results, then one to two seconds, fast ingestion, access to real-time data, over 300 times improvement in query performance compared to Postgres, and you know significant a uh, reduction in the total cost of ownership, okay? 50% lower TCO. So moving to a modern architecture and single store is, you know, a distributed SQL database system, separation of storage and compute. It provides, uh, um, you know, a, a number of key benefits that we looked at a little bit earlier on in terms of some of the capabilities, the multimodal capabilities and the integrations and so on, that it is much more than just a, a database management system, but a platform that gives you uh, additional um, means to be able to achieve your business uh, uh, needs. Okay, moving on then, let's talk about uh, two other, three other, two to three other uh, customers and their experiences. Okay, so Amis, um, company based on this kind of IoT and taking in you know, this uh, uh, data from these IoT devices, lots of events being registered for their customers. Um, key challenge for them, size limitations with Postgres, lack of scalability with Elasticsearch. Okay, so you can see that they are very similar sort of in terms of a journey that they had a, a, a similar to Adobe. Data pipeline cost more than a, a million dollars annually. They had very strict SLAs as well, 1.5 seconds across three days worth of data. Um, they tried this as both a managed service and on-prem solution, okay? And uh, that's the approach that they've taken. So recall that I mentioned a little bit earlier on that you can do this with single store now, that you can have part of your architecture, your infrastructure running on-prem and part of that deployed in the cloud. Uh, and that's the uh, uh, option that they've gone for. Um, huge number of events, a hundred billion events per day, 
1.2 billion sessions per day, a million rows per second loading complex data, 30 terabytes of data sets in largest customer environments, and huge reduction in cost, you know, 70% cost reduction. Um, and then this is just kind of summarized there on the right-hand side, okay? So again, a, a, a rather happy customer there. It's moving from uh, Postgres. Factors AI, again, marketing analytics, uh, similar to uh, the uh, Adobe case study. And uh, the challenge for them, no real-time analytics with queries, sometimes taking you know up to five minutes to run. Uh, customers unable to plan campaigns and launch within a business day. And that, as you know, today, time is money. You know, everything needs to be done quickly and you need to be able to get out there because if you don't do it, your competitors will be doing it. So solution, real-time analytics, they needed support for both SQL and JSON to minimize rewrites of their applications. And uh, what they were able to do then in terms of their outcomes, run a query with 50 million records within 20 seconds. I'm guessing they're doing fairly complex processing there as well. Analysis on real-time data up to 40 times faster. And they were able to move relatively easily from Postgres to single store because of the SQL wire uh, compatibility. Um, as an aside, just worth mentioning that single store is both MySQL wire compatible and MongoDB wire compatible. And obviously it supports SQL. Okay, that's one of the... Uh, um, uh, methods here as described in terms of uh, the benefit uh, uh, moving across from uh, Postgres to uh, single store. And again, you can see the summary there uh, on the right-hand side there. 30 times faster query response, 50 million records, 30 to 40 times faster time to value for factors.ai customers. And then the last one here, uh, this one, uh, Lumana. Uh, so video monitoring for surveillance for safety and security. Okay, so their previous data infrastructure built on Postgres, too slow for real-time analytics. Uh, interestingly, they moved to a pure vector database, Pinecone, but its capabilities did not meet the requirements and it just added complexity and cost for them. And they chose single store to store video, you know, to build their video monitoring platform uh, using the single store. Uh, so what are they able to achieve? Now performing image matching and video monitoring for a variety of use cases, occupational safety and security and surveillance. So these are, as you know, within organizations, there may be particular laws that you adhere to uh, or need to adhere to within, uh, you know, depending on your geography and the particular sort of country that you're operating in. Uh, they can analyze millions of hours of video embeddings to drive these use cases, provide real-time alerts to drive proactive response, deliver complex hybrid vector plus full text search results in two seconds. So one of the nice benefits of uh, single store, we talked about it in that slide I showed you a little bit earlier on, is yes, we have vector support improved earlier this year. So through the uh, ability to do uh, ANN indexing, for example, a dedicated vector data type now as well, but we offer the full text support uh, as well through the Lucene, and that received a bump in the recent uh, iceberg uh, um, event that uh, uh, was uh, um, announced and launched, okay? Uh, and so what you can do now is you can do both semantic search and full text search, and you can combine the two as well. So you get the benefits of both. So there may be some cases where one is a little bit better in terms of what you're looking for. In other cases, it may be the other one. In some cases, you may benefit from using both of them together. Uh, so again, uh, summary on the right-hand side, millions of hours of video embeddings, two seconds for complex hybrid search, one second for real-time alerts. Uh, and I know real-time is means different things to different people, but for them, the one second sort of time frame is sufficient for what they're looking for. It meets their SLA um, and, and that's great. Okay, so from a business perspective, they, they've got what they wanted. Uh, so again, just uh, summarizing that here. So really gone through several technologies, started with Postgres, uh, moved to Pinecone. Neither of those was able to uh, give them the uh, requirements or meet the, their uh, sort of uh, objectives. And they eventually moved across to single store where they were able to uh, achieve their business objectives. All right then. Okay. So couple of examples there from your real customers. And again, if you're interested, I mean, we can provide you more references if you if you wish, just reach out to us. And again, if you if it's something that you're interested in thinking about, 
whether you'd like to evaluate the technology, uh, you know, by all means, contact us and uh, we can work with you, understand your requirements and provide technical resources to work with you uh, and uh, uh, arrange workshops and so on. A uh, couple of ways that you could do it. And this is the thing that I really wanted to highlight for you. Sadly, I don't have this a working version to show you today. It's in development, okay? So perhaps we'll, Yukti and I will we'll see if we can organize another webinar to focus specifically on the CDC, but I can show you something similar, okay? Now, other ways you could do it, there are some built-in tools within Postgres itself that you could utilize, or of course, there is the old fashioned way in terms of using some extract, transform and load technology. And just as a, a sort of by the by, let me just uh, mention a couple of things. So Single Store has developed this uh, change data capture technology. Uh, we have it working and available for two key products that I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier on. So MongoDB and MySQL, those are GA and available now. And so single store, um, this uh, Postgres one is in development, okay, coming later. And so what this gives you is this ability to set this CDC pipeline up with some other system, be able to ingest from that, both in terms of snapshot and subsequent data that's uh, uh, arrived into the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, external system, for example. And then the other thing that you can do is that as long as that pipeline is up and running, any new data that arrive will make its way into single store as well. So we'll look at that momentarily, right? And there are other ways that, of course, these this pipeline technology, which I showed you a little bit earlier on, uh, it does work with all of these other things as well. So HDFS, Kafka, okay, Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure, and uh, again, time permitting, let me just check the time. We're doing well today, so I may be able to show you that uh, uh, working with those. Uh, ETL integration and migration. So we have a great uh, partnership with uh, Fivetran. Okay, so that might be a solution for you as well. And Airbyte. Okay, so these offer possibilities. Uh, and then again, there's uh, other tooling as well to migrate from legacy databases as well, easily load from local file system or cloud storage. Okay, again, that's something we can discuss uh, in, in another event. All right then, so how can Single Store help then? Uh, I've talked about this uh, a few moments ago. So go live acceleration. Professional services can help with complex migrations, ease planning and execution. And these could be, you know, depending on the scale of the work that's involved, small projects, medium or large well-defined migration planning and execution. Okay, so we will work with you to identify, do the assessment, you know, design and plan, migrate and validate, post-migration support and cutover support. And what I would say is one of the nice things about the CDC technology is that it gives you the opportunity to try out single store without sacrificing your existing system or your existing environment. So if you are, you know, to give you some confidence. So you keep your investment within Postgres, for example, you're able to connect it to a single store environment using the CDC. The data will be propagated to single store. Now you can do all of those nice things that you couldn't do with Postgres, for example, JSON analytics, vector uh, with full text search, for example, and so on. Um, and you keep that existing investment. And at some point in time, when you are ready and you feel that you've, you know, you're ready to uh, uh, shut down the Postgres, uh, you can you can do so. Okay, because the, remember, the CDC gives you the opportunity to effectively mirror your Postgres environment. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo and again apologies that it's not postgres specific so i believe it's in private preview and it's in development okay so if you're interested get in touch with us and again you may be able to get access to that um but what i'll show you is something uh that uh, utilizes the equivalent within the uh, two other products that i mentioned mongodb and mysql and s3 okay so i'll show you how how easy it is to set up how we can get the data in. And then once it's in single store, of course, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do with that. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. All right, so let me just go over here. Okay, so the link that uh, Yukti provided and should be in the chat will take you to this page. Literally it takes 
you know, less than a minute to sign up. You can do so with Google. You can do so with Microsoft or the old fashioned way using your first name, last name and so on. Okay. And then once you've done that, you've signed in and you'll see something that looks like this. Okay. So let me just see if I can make this a bit bigger. So makes it a bit more interesting then. Uh, I think that should be okay. That's reasonable in terms of uh, font size. Um, okay, so in order to utilize the uh, CDC pipelines and the notebook environment, you need to create some compute resources. Now recall, single store provides this separation of storage and compute. So you need some compute resources, okay, which we can provision very quickly. Uh, the free tier will allow you to do that almost instantaneously. So if I look on the right, uh, sorry, left-hand side, uh, let me just get my uh, arrow here. Okay, so if we take a look here in terms of uh, deployments, okay, let's take a look at this. There we go. Click on this. Now here I've got some stuff just below here. That's fine. We'll ignore that for now. And then at the top here, you can see that uh, I've got some resources provisioned here already. I share this environment with other colleagues as well, but I can choose this thing here, uh, new deployment, okay? And let's take a look at this. So this will give me two options here, okay? So I've got the starter here, okay? Or the standard. Now, Currently, I believe in order to correctly utilize the CDC and the pipelines, you need the standard environment, okay? But if you want to just get up and running quickly, just play with the technology, understand how single store works, the starter is absolutely fine. Um, here, I've got something provisioned already, but let me just talk you through this. So you can see I can opt to choose my group name. I'll leave, take the default there, that's fine. We've got these three different cloud providers here. Okay, so AWS, GCP, Azure, and then depending on uh, um, which one of those you choose, you can uh, select your appropriate region as well. So I guess for myself, if I want something physically closer, just go for Europe West to London. Okay, and uh, we can just click on next down at the bottom here. Okay, and then here, uh, most of these settings are absolutely fine. Again, I can choose to change this workspace name. <coughs> Excuse me. And here I have the opportunity under size to really configure my environment. Uh, usually for a lot of my demos, I simply use this S00, which is two virtual CPUs, 16 gigabytes of RAM, usually because my demos tend to be fairly small scale. Uh, but obviously we work with customers on huge projects. And then here you can see you have the option to select quite a lot. And then some of these are ghosted out here. They're <laughs> probably because I think these need special uh, enablement simply because they are very large. You've got uh, literally over 3,000 virtual CPUs, 24 terabytes of RAM. Uh, and that, uh, obviously that burns through enormous number of credits. Uh, but that's fine. Okay, I mean, if you have the requirements that scale up to that level, uh, we can do it, okay? And then just uh, create workspace, okay? So now I'll skip this, okay? Because I already have something running. Let me just show you. So I'll go back, go back. And then down here, you can see that this is my workspace. So this is my kind of compute resources. And then I've got multiple databases attached here. This is the uh, separation of storage and compute. And I can attach, detach, change the read write privileges to just read only, for example, lots of other things. I will leave those databases alone because I'm sharing this environment with other colleagues that so they may well be using uh, some of those. Uh, but here again, we have the opportunity in terms of uh, various tools that we can connect to. And so you can see CLI client, SQL IDD, ID and so on. And this will give you the, the details of the host as well and the port number and so on. Okay, so if you want to connect to external tools, uh, those will be available. So with that said, I, I have a, a notebook that I promised that I would show you. And I think that once our uh, Postgres uh, CDC solution is available and ready to use, I wouldn't be surprised if this particular example where we're actually using three technologies, in this case, MySQL, uh, MongoDB, and uh, S3 was extended to include Postgres as well, okay? 
So essentially, the way that the pipelines are created, the actual solution itself, obviously, it will vary a little bit depending on the technology, but the general principle is the same. Okay, and I'll show you the general principle. So at the top here, okay, all I need to do is just ensure that I'm connected to the correct resources here. So I will make sure that this is pointing to, um, okay, I'll use this one. And I think banking analytics was the example. Okay. So you can see I ran this a little bit earlier on, but let me just run this little bit of uh, Python code here. It just sets up a couple of uh, couple of libraries there and just install that. Okay. And then here we just ensure that if the database already exists, we just drop it. Okay. So we've got this database called banking analytics that we're going to look at. Okay, so it just deletes it, start fresh, and then create it again. There we go. And then I'm just informed that just make sure that I'm actually connected to this thing from the pull down above. Otherwise, subsequent uh, cells won't work correctly. So here you can see the general kind of uh, syntax of the, the way that this link is created. This is specific for MySQL. Okay, here you can see but the equivalent will be available for Postgres. So essentially all we do, we need to provide a little bit of detail. So the host name, for example, okay. Uh, any particular things that we want to exclude. So here we, we don't want the uh, performance schema, for example, uh, what is the table or tables that we want to include? So we are looking at something called uh, domain analytics uh, with something, uh, the uh, transactions table, uh, the port number, okay. Uh, that we are using SSL mode, okay, that's required. And then we provide our credentials just down below here, okay? So the database and the actual uh, database user as well, all right? So we just create this link. There we go. And then this is the uh, where the magic happens. Essentially, what we simply say is, okay, infer this pipeline as load data, okay, using the link. And we and get the data across. Okay, just takes a moment or two to. Oh, there we go. No link with name. My SQL link. Let's have a look. Why? What's happened here? Let me try this again. Okay, let's just go back here. Ah, okay. You see, uh, you, if you're sharp-eyed, if you look here, you'll see that that has switched. Okay, so let me just get this back to where we were. Okay, let's just here and here, that's it. So apologies, fat fingers sometimes <laughs> don't help. Let me try that again. Okay, there we go. Um, there will be ways to set up these connections programmatically uh, within the notebook in the very near future as well. The SDK that is part of this will make this a lot easier rather than have, having to rely upon this, for example. You can hard code that into the notebook itself. So that's done. And then essentially here, so far we've done nothing. We've essentially established the connection, providing the details of the remote system. And then we've said, okay, we're going to use um, uh, Avro as the means to, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of the data that's coming across. And then here, basically, now we just say start the pipeline. Okay, now it's going to copy the data across from that remote server into our single store uh, uh, database. All right, that's great. So that's step one done. Step two is that we will create a table here. Okay, this is called ATM locations. And this will do so in this uh, same database. And then in order to populate this, notice here that the syntax here is for a pipeline. And we are using S3, okay? So that's the location of this. And uh, we can set this up in this particular case, no credentials to provide. And we are saying, okay, feed that into this table just above that we've created and then start that pipeline as well. So now this is the second pipeline that we've got uh, uh, up and running. 
And then finally, a third system that we're going to connect to is MongoDB. So again, notice that the link here, the, for, the syntax, very similar to MySQL, and it'll be very similar for Postgres as well. So again, we need to provide some config configuration details. What is the remote host that we want to connect to? Sorry, my uh, magnifier is not uh, uh, showing everything correctly there, but that's okay. You get the gist of it. And uh, what is it we're interested in? We're interested in this particular database and all the collections within it. And uh, SSL mode is true. Uh, the admin, okay. And a couple of other options specific to MongoDB, okay. So this will be the same for the Postgres. And then here, again, we're providing our credentials and so on. And that's done. And then again, similar sort of syntax here in terms of the pipeline itself. Infer pipeline is load data link for the Mongo format Avro. Again, use that. Okay, so set that up. So remember, it's not, this is just to do the setup, but not actually copy anything across yet. Once that comes back to us, because what it's doing is it's looking at the remote system and then figuring out, you know, what is the structure of the data? What, what's over on the other side? Now we say, okay, start that pipeline. And so if we, uh, yeah, there we go. It's uh, currently you can see that we've got two pipelines running. The third one for the Mongo is not running. We'll run that. And then we can take a look what's actually come across then. How how much have we got across from the uh, uh, MySQL? Well, it's copied across over 5,000 rows from there. And then as soon as that's done, we can actually start doing interesting things, you know, looking at the uh, type of transactions. So here we're interested in deposit, for example. Okay, just limit to one. And then here we can take a look at the data from the S3 bucket. And currently it's 147 records. And here's, again, take a look at uh, what it's brought across in terms of these ATM transactions. Okay, so it's told us the latitude, the longitude, for example. And then finally here, you can see here the JSON data that's brought across from MongoDB. Okay, so single store will happily store that and work with that. Uh, a better way is to use single store Kai. All right, there we go. And then we can actually do joins across all of this data. So the data that was inferred from the MySQL and from the MongoDB, those tables are created for us. We specifically created one for the S3 bucket, but now that the data are streaming in and we've got all of these pipelines up and running, and if we go back and just uh, rerun this command here, where is it? There we go, this one. Show us the pipelines. We can see that all of them are now running, okay? There we go. Okay bank profile, bank history, okay? So notice that although we set up three systems, there's actually four pipelines because there are multiple tables, okay? So that's all done for us. And then we can actually use SQL to do joins across all of that data, get useful insights into that. And here we are combining the data from all these different sources and then getting that uh, uh, the query results there and so on, okay? So here's another example just below here. Um, and then you can see here some of the uh, the JSON data here being returned for uh, from uh, MongoDB, for example. And even here you can see the uh, format uh, pipeline for Mongo. Okay, this is an aggregation pipeline. So if you are familiar with uh, MongoDB, you will recognize this. And you can see that this is using the uh, syntax for that particular product, okay? And then we can get the uh, data back here um, and so on, okay? I mean, we're I think we're almost at the end. So I'll just go through the last couple of things here. And then finally, you know, we just create some uh, plots. Oh, some vision, I think I've missed something here. Let me do this and let's have a look. There we go. Okay, and so on. So key point here is that Currently, today, MongoDB, MySQL, this CDC solution is GA and available. Postgres is in the pipeline. If you're interested and would like to be a sort of a you know private uh, um, view customer, uh, get in touch with us. 
And uh, again, Yukti and I will try to uh, organize something in the very near future to actually demonstrate that. And maybe we'll pick something a, a lot larger in terms of database size. I know we have some uh, large databases uh, available internally that we can use. So maybe of the order of uh, uh, you know gigabytes, tens of gigabytes. Uh, I'm conscious though that you know within the time frame that we have for these events, you can only so show so much, but you know at least if we get some data streaming in and we can run some queries on that, that will demonstrate to you that yes, it's working. Um, and it, it, you know we can do queries on the data that's already arrived, even whilst the data are still streaming in. So that could be very valuable. Okay, so just to summarize then, so we've seen a couple of uh, customer case studies. We've talked about some of the benefits that single store can provide. We uh, have discussed some of the limitations of Postgres. Um, as great as the technology is, these customers as well experience some difficulties and challenges in terms of meeting SLAs and scaling the, scaling the product. Um, so the CDC pipeline, I think, will be an awesome uh, addition to the two that are already available, as well as pipelines in general, which we can currently use with uh, Kafka, for example, with S3, Hadoop, HDFS, and so on. So that gives you a wide range of technologies that you can use to connect to very different external systems and stream the data in and create your visualizations, your analytics, and so on, and do these at scale. Okay, so with that, I will stop there. I, I realize we've got a couple of minutes, hopefully, and uh, Yukti, you will uh, have uh, maybe one or two questions for me that we might be able to cover before yes, you do your talk. Thank you. thank you so much for the session. That was really informative. Akmal, I was wondering if you have a link to the demo that we might be using. Or oh, like... yes, great. Yes, thank you very much for reminding me. Right, so uh, I'm and I'm, normally I show this, and I apologize I didn't today, but this particular notebook uh, is available from... Uh, the, let me just choose this one, okay? Because this is a bit more clearer. So if you go to the, the left-hand side here, okay? You can see here uh, deployments and you can see here Data Studio, okay? So these are the two key things that I, I use today. So Data Studio, you select this here. And then can you see that just along the middle here, there's a set of options. One of these says Gallery, okay? So if you select gallery, it's got a whole bunch of notebooks there, as you can see, uh, covering a wide range of technologies. Vector search with Kai, for example, launch open source apps with Langchain, load JSON files with pipeline from S3, and so on. And so this one, uh, let me just try and see if I can find it, but this was the uh, NoSQL SQL, here we are. So Unified data analytics, SQL and NoSQL on a single uh, single database with Kai. Okay, so that was the one that I was uh, uh, working with. Okay, now this is incorrect. Okay, there is a slight problem today. It's a little bit broken. Uh, this should be fixed. Equally, if you just go to GitHub, look at uh, our GitHub repo. There is, um, uh, I think it's single store hyphen labs, and just look for spaces. Uh, you'll be able to find the very same notebook here that uh, I mentioned, okay? This one, SQL and NoSQL on a single database with Kai, and that's how I actually loaded it up a little bit earlier. So I apologize, there's a, there's a slight, uh, uh, the, the, this has been logged, okay? This is a small problem today, sorry about that, but uh, essentially uh, that's where you would find it, okay? And this is the very same one that I was using. So hopefully we'll be able to extend it with Postgres as well in the very near future. Great, thank you. Uh, so we will just make sure to include the link to the notebook in our follow-up emails and whoever that registered should get a uh, email with the recording yeah. and the useful uh, relevant- uh, I'll send you the GitHub repo link for it. Uh, and, the, yeah. Right? That'll be easier. Yeah, that would be better because we can just follow up that way. So yes, we, ha we just have like a minute. So we can take a one question from Chris. They say, uh, except for the relational part, which cons and pros would you make versus Elasticsearch, which seems to cover a lot of similar use cases, JSON-based analytics, full-text search, and vectors? 
Yeah, the great question. I, I think we have somewhere on our website, there is a comparison between single store and elastic. I think it's from a couple of years ago, though. There was a detailed benchmark that was done. Um, beyond that, of course, you know, lots of technologies are looking very similar today. I mean, with the database systems in particular, I mean, it's almost one of these commodities that you can just buy off the shelf. So I think single store's key selling point is all of the kind of things that I talked about today, separation of storage and compute, uh, the ability to scale out the SQL, the, the you know, the Jupyter Notebook integration, uh, all of these kind of things make you very productive very fast. Uh, the free tier gives you the ability to get started immediately. And then if you are working with existing systems, the ability to connect to those, keep your existing investment in those existing systems, copy your data across the single store, have your single store environment, run the analytics, be confident that and happy that, yes, this is achieving what you want to achieve. Uh, and then at some point in time, you can get rid of the, uh, you know, the, the in quotes, legacy systems. Uh, but the elastic search one, yes, good point. Um, I think what we can do, uh, Yukti, is again, find a link to that and you can send it out as part of the email. So we'll uh, uh, we'll get a copy of that, uh, um, uh, that uh, blog post. Right. I'll just try to pull it up and you can... Take a one more question from Andreas. We uh, they say that when you talked about the comparison to PG vector, you mentioned that you compared with the IVF plot in PG vector. Did yes. you perform also a comparison with the HNSW of PG vector? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the 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 link in this. Uh, let me just find it. I think it's this one here. Uh, this references the work from the Purdue Database Research Group. And I think there you can see that there is some comparison with, uh, uh, again, let me just try and you've got the single store HNSW and the PG uh, vector HNSW, okay? So that blog post goes into a lot more detail than I was able to show you on that simple graph that was included in my presentation. So this, again, blog post, I mean, again, again, you can see, I can send you the link for that. You're very welcome to send this as part of the follow-up email. Uh, and I think the paper by this database research group at Purdue, I'm not sure if it's actually been published. Let's see, when was this, when was this article published? Uh, this was a couple of months ago, so I would hope the research paper was published. We'll see if we can get a link to that as well. Right. So I found an article from Rockset, actually, which oh. compared single store <laughs> versus Elasticsearch. It's, okay. I think we, we don't have it on our page anymore, so I'm just sending that in the chat. So all right, it's all right. I'll do some digging, okay, and, and uh, I'll send you what I find, okay. So we yeah, we can uh, we can uh, we can take that offline and and sort that out, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, I think we can conclude the webinar now because we are almost at the top of the hour. We are really sorry for going a little bit uh, beyond the time that was decided. So yeah. apologies in advance if we if you have any more questions you can that we cannot answer live. Our team will follow up with each and every one of you afterwards via email. So please feel free to keep the questions coming. And just a reminder that the Q&A button is at the bottom of your console. So thank you so much, Akmal, for the tremendous job. This was really interesting. And just a small reminder for our raffle today that you can see on your screen, you can still have a chance to sign up and win the uh, win the rewards and we will announce the winner one more winner by the end of today's day and uh, just feel free to try out single store notebooks and you will be automatically be eligible and be enrolled to win the rewards and thank you so much for joining and i'll see you for the next webinar so Tomorrow. announcement that everyone's <laughs> yeah we have, have it tomorrow so that it's announcement that again tomorrow <laughs> Right, it's the same timing. Okay. So okay. I just announced the raffle winner. So the raffle winner for today's webinar goes to Mudasar Sheikh. He is the director of machine learning operations at Sony Pictures Entertainment. Oh, Thank you congratulations. for joining. Congratulations. And that's not you. Please don't give up and you still have a chance. Just go and register, make a free account. Just takes a few seconds and just try a single store notebooks. Very similar to Jupyter Notebooks. And I'll see you all tomorrow. And thank you so much for joining. Have a thank good you, day, everyone. wherever you are. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.